Well, hallelujah. We're going to go ahead and get started in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start reading verses 12 through 15. She can put that up on the board. But uh, I've been doing this series, and, and I don't know, this morning might be the last uh, installment of the series, if you will. I, I was looking at this one spot that, that looks like that would be really good. But let's just go ahead and read. Now, now what we've done is we've been doing a series on prayer. Because I believe that it's extremely important for the people of God to understand that prayer is, is so needed in the life of the believer, uh, a person that, that truly has a relationship with the Lord to spend time. It's about communication. Relationship is all about communication. Amen. And, and it's the same way with the Lord. It, we need to be able to communicate with God. And I'm just going to be real with you. I'm a transparent kind of God that there's been so many seasons in my life, even as a pastor, where my prayer life was not the way that it needed to be. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about earning your righteousness. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm talking about the fact that God made a way. He sent his son and he sent his son to die. And that you and I, through faith in that, can have a personal relationship with Jesus. And the word of God says that we can go through the name of Jesus and that we can make a connection to the father and that he wants us to pray. Now, I believe this with all of my heart. I honestly do. Based upon the scripture that the word of God teaches that God created this earth for human beings to have dominion and authority upon this earth. When God created Adam, he gave him power and authority upon the earth. And according to the Genesis narrative, whenever Adam fell the way of deception to the serpent, he lost that power to the enemy of God. That's what the word of God says in Luke chapter 4. The enemy says that I, all these kingdoms have been delivered unto me. He was trying to do the same thing to Jesus that he did to Adam. And he was trying to deceive Jesus and get Jesus to go the way of the first Adam. And he said, all these kingdoms have been delivered unto me and I give them to whom I will. But I have to tell you that in Jesus, praise God, those that are born again from the dead have now the spirit of God living on the inside of them. And what we do not realize is this, is the power and the authority that we have been given. And I'm talking about in the spiritual realm to believe God and to be used by God. And God's hand moves through prayer. You have things going on in your life and you desire for God to move. Listen, this isn't just put your coin in the slot machine and kind of like roll something up like that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people that have given their heart to the Lord and have have legitimate needs and they're going to God and we're not just asking for what he can give us but instead we're partnering with the Lord because we know that he wants things done on this earth amen God wants people's souls saved God wants people's lives changed God wants people's marriages restored. God wants people's children re, uh, to serve God. God wants lost souls to be won into the kingdom of God because God does not want people going to the next life deceived and not saved and under the blood of Jesus. Amen. And so that's why we've been doing this series on prayer because I personally believe that in the lives of many Christians and I'm not the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you specifically, but I believe that in the lives of many Christians, their prayer life is lacking. Right. And so I'm not going to repeat to you all the topics that we've already prayed about or preached about, but it comes out of the Lord's prayer. If you will, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, part number one, the individual. Your will be done, part number two, the warfare that God is engaged in, right? And then, uh, and then recently, uh, we now we're going to pre preach on and forgive us our debts, amen. So let's let's read verses twelve through fifteen. It says, and, and forgive us our debts, or it could be translated as trespasses. And the idea is sin, our failures. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, I, I find it interesting that it doesn't seem like this verse 14 and 15 is really part of the prayer. But yet it's, the translators put it that way because they, they kept it in the same paragraph. You know, in the, Hebrew, in the Greek, there's not paragraphs, but the translators are a little smarter than I am. And they thought that it was, they put it in the same paragraph. So the thought is still there. And he goes on to say this. He says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. 
But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Now, I don't know that I'm going to preach it next week, but this verse 13 deserves just at least a little bit of attention. Where it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And, and I want you to know that the Lord knows what he's talking about. When he said, because see, the, the scripture says that Jesus, on, in the midst of his fast, after he was baptized, was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he had to be tempted by the devil to be proven that he was whom he was going to say that he was, that he was the one that was sent by God, that he was the one that actually was promised through all of the prophets, through the nation of Israel, or even, even before the nation of Israel, for all of these years that he was the promised one that was coming. But see, for you and I, he's letting us know, listen, let's, this needs to be part of our prayer. Lord, lead me not into temptation. You know, there's a scripture in James that says when a man is tempted by evil, let him not say that he's tempted by God, but that each man is actually tempted and led astray because of what's already on the inside of him. And, and, and God doesn't tempt people with evil, but he will allow for, for your good, for my good, for us to be tested. And, and, and sometimes and he and listen, he will sometimes allow the enemy to set up. Well, no, the enemy sets up traps all the time for believers. And you and I need to become a lot more savvy, if I can use that word, a lot more aware of the tactics of our enemy. We have we have a very he's a he's a very intelligent enemy and he knows and he sets traps and he sets snares. And, and that's one of the things, you know, the scripture talks about that. That the, it, it, the word of God talks about the fact that Satan, he said, Paul said this, we are not ignorant of his devices. The enemy has devices and traps that he sets for people. And that's part of the process of temptation. But Paul said we're not ignorant of it. And, and so we need to be aware of how the enemy wants to trap us. And, and the only way we can learn that is through Prayer and through understanding the word of God and we can begin to view the world that we're living in through the lens of scripture. But listen, if, you, if we just keep falling into traps, because, you know, the scripture also says this in Psalm 91, it says he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Yeah. And, and, you know, in the snare of the fowler, you know what a fowler is? It's a bird catcher and they got traps for birds. And, and listen, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a military man. I don't know any really much about military other than the fact that I try to study the concept of understanding your enemy because you and I need to understand that our enemy has tactics and he will set traps and he baits his traps and many times when we're unaware we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight too at that Bible study but many times when we're unaware of the traps we oftentimes keep falling into the same old trap and as we see the repetitive nature of these traps so the Lord's saying Lord lead us not into temptation but instead deliver us from evil. Yes. And that scripture in Psalm 91 says this. He will deliver you from the yes. snare of the fowl. Yes. Amen. Praise God. And so. But but the, the main part of what our thrust of our message is. Is that is this. Is that. Uh, that we would forgive. That he would forgive our debts. As we forgive our debtors. You know one of the things that I want to say is this. Is that the citizens of God's kingdom. Are people that have been forgiven. Through faith. In Jesus' sacrifice. Amen. Jesus said this. He said that he was the cornerstone. I thought it was interesting. One of their songs talked about the foundation. Let our foundation be your majesty. And I had a thought here. And Jesus was the cornerstone. He said that I am the cornerstone. He said I am the stone of stumbling and the stone of rejection. And he said this. He said I am the stone that the builders rejected. And what he was talking about when he was speaking was this, that he was the one that was promised in the ages of old, but that when he finally showed up, he didn't look like what the leaders were expecting. And so they rejected him. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day, that when Rome was of the empire and had Israel under its bondage, but these religious leaders, they rejected the notion that Jesus was the one because he was actually born of a carpenter. But let me tell you this, Jesus, that carpenter Joseph was actually the rightful heir to the kingly throne of David. And so Jesus being the firstborn in the house, even though he was born of incorruptible seed in the virgin, he was born into the house of Joseph and that's 
as the firstborn, according to the lineage of the word of God, he was the rightful heir to the Davidic throne, to King David's throne. Amen. And this is God's plan. But he was the stone of stumbling and that he said this. He said, those that will fall upon that stone, they will be broken. And so the idea is this, is, is that he is the one and many times it's a stone of stumbling because people don't want to fall on the stone. Many times people in the midst of their pride refuse to go the way of the Lord. Many times when people hear the word of God, they reject the word of God. But the Lord said that if people would fall upon that stone, that they would be broken. But that brokenness is in a good sense. That they would be broken in humility. Yeah. That their life would be broken and then he yeah. would build them back up. Yeah. And so sometimes you might feel like you're broken and you might feel like it's hopeless and it's helpless. But I'm here to tell you, those are the kind of people that God oh. uses. Amen. Yeah. He does. And he'll change your life. But he said, but those that reject it, then the stone's going to fall on them and it's going to grind them yeah. into powder. So you don't want to reject the stone. When you have the opportunity to receive the truth of the gospel, you don't want to reject it. You want to at least ask the Lord. You want to call out to God and you want to say, God, reveal your truth to me. God, I don't want to reject your word. Amen. Lord, if you are true and, and your word is true, have your way Amen. on the inside of me. Amen. I say if because not everybody agrees with me. I know what I believe. Amen. I know what he's done in my life. And I'm not backing up. Praise God. So the cornerstone, I want you to know this too, is the beginning of the foundation in ancient buildings. I've taught this before. I'm not a construction guy either. But they, don't, they didn't pour slabs back then. And so they get a big cornerstone and that was square. And off of that stone, they would begin to build the foundation. And I need you to know that Jesus is that cornerstone. And, and Jesus is the beginning and the end of the foundation of God's kingdom. Now, I'm using that thought as this. Forgiveness is the foundation on which God built his kingdom. We can sing, let, your, let our foundation be your majesty because he's also the king. Amen. And it's his kingdom. Praise God. But his kingdom and the foundation of his kingdom is truly built upon the concept of forgiveness. And the apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. He said this, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Yes. See, and Jesus' cross is forgiveness. Amen. That's the whole point to the cross. The whole point to the cross is that the word of God teaches is that God created Adam out of and out of the dust of the earth. That might be hard for scientists to believe, but that's their problem. They're over here trying to contradict the word of God. I believe in the God that created the heaven and earth and all that in them is. I done took enough science to know the Krebs cycle and I sat in that class and I'm like, how in the world, sir, are you teaching me physiology and anatomy? Do not see God and a creator in the Krebs cycle. Okay, I'm not going to get in all that right now. And all I see is screaming a, a, an intelligent design that's creating a body that's fearfully and wonderfully made. How we're coming out with two different conclusions. I know I'm just a little student and you're the professor, but I don't get it. Okay, and so I'm just trying to tell you, I believe this. With all of my heart. And I believe that that's the whole point on why God sent Jesus was because he created Adam from the earth. And this was before the earth was fallen. See, the Bible teaches this. Because of the fall of Adam, the whole earth is grown. Yeah, the whole, all of creation groans. And it's waiting for the day when God, for the manifestation of the sons of man. Now, you know, that's prophetic in one way. In one way, it's kind of like God, the, all creation is awaiting for the sons of God, you and I, to stand up and to be the sons of God that we're called to be today. But it's also prophetic in the nature that there's coming a day, amen, when God's going to make it all right. When we're going to receive our glorified bodies. I believe that. I believe it with everything that's in me because it's written in this word right here. And, and, and so all creation fell when Adam fell. See, and, and, and so it, it talks about. And so, so now Adam, who was originally created in the image and likeness of God, has now has a sinful nature. And so when he reproduces, I know I've been saying this a lot lately, but I want to get it in your head and in your heart. So when he reproduces now, he reproduces after the image and likeness of fallen Adam instead of after the image and likeness of God. And so now the earth is filled with chaos. The earth is filled with human beings that have a sinful nature. And then you add to that a diabolical foe that has schemes and methods, according to the Greek language, 
Methodia methods, and he's got traps, and he's got snares, and he deceives, and he has power on earth, we end up in the midst of a mess of chaos. We end up in the midst of a bunch of deception and a bunch of lies, and people don't know which way to go. And the whole time, God's always had a witness on the earth, somebody that's willing to use their mouth to speak forth the truth of God. And so God, through that process, created a nation called Israel, right? After the fall, after the flood, after the Tower of Babel, he called that man Abraham. Hallelujah. And he made a nation out of that man called Israel. And what he gave through that nation Israel was Jesus. He gave the world Jesus. All for the purpose of dying on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin. I'm trying to talk about a foundation right now. I'm trying to talk about the fact that the foundation of God's kingdom is built upon forgiveness. Amen. Let's, let's just talk about this word forgiveness a little bit. The word forgiveness means pardon of sin and remission from its penalty, resulting in pardon, liberty, deliverance from the imprisonment of sin. You know, you can listen. I used a, a legal illustration last week. I was thinking you could use sometimes, you know, whether whatever your position is on doctors, you know, that's fine, you know, whatever the case, but I'm saying you can imagine how a person would feel if they heard that they had stage four cancer, they went through treatment, and then next thing you know, the oncologist tells them, oh, by the way, you're in remission from your cancer. It, you, the penalty of your death, it, you're in remission. You think they wouldn't be an excited person? Well, I'm here to tell you that through what Jesus did, we've been pardoned of sin, and see, the Bible says this, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can also use a legal term. That somebody was guilty and that they went to court, you know, and, I, and some people use the, the fact that somebody else might have paid a fine for them, but they went to court. They knew that they were guilty. The judge tells them, son, you can get up and you can go ahead and go home. And, and he's like, he's like, you mean I'm free to go? Y'all believe me that I'm innocent? No, son, you're not innocent. We know you're not innocent, but somebody else was willing to pay your penalty. Somebody else was willing to go to prison for you. Somebody else was willing to die for you is what the gospel says regarding Jesus. Because whether we believe it or not, God says we've all offended him. All of us born in Adam. You got to understand that. You know, when I first started preaching, the people look at me like, why are you calling me a sinner? I'm not calling you a sinner. I'm calling us all sinners. Yeah, We're yeah, all yeah. born of Adam. And look, my daddy used to play cards. And we've all thrown our ante into the pot. We've all given into the pot. And so, but good news, good news. God the Father sent Jesus and it's all about pardon. Amen. You know, the scripture says in Romans, it says this, whereas in, in Romans 5, 12, you can put it up there if you want. It says this, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. That's the one man, Adam. That's what the scripture says. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have Sin. I want to talk to you a little bit about one more word that's kind of like forgiveness. It's called atonement. Go up one verse, Haley, if you don't mind, and go to Romans 5.11. It says this, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. I want you to see that. See, through Jesus Christ, we have received the atonement. Now, I want you to know in the Greek language that the word, and the reason I say that is because that's what the New Testament's written in is Greek and it's translated into English. But the word means the business of money changers, exchanging equivalent values. In God's eyes, there was an equivalent value to pardon your sin. It required an equivalent value. See, the scales of, of legality, they have to, they're supposed to be just and they're supposed to be balanced. And it can't just be a situation where God just frees you and pardons you and remits your sin. No, the price of sin has to be paid for. And through the atonement of what Jesus did, God was able to allow an exchange to take place. When Jesus hung naked on the cross, God allowed your sin and my sin to be placed on him where he became the sin offering. And the exchange was is that he allowed the righteousness of Jesus to be placed on us. And that now when we believe that by faith, amen, you got you to accept it by faith. The Bible says you must believe in your heart 
and confess with your mouth. There needs to be a public confession of your faith. And when you do that, when you believe in your heart, not just your head, but your heart, and you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you believe that he died on the cross for you and that he rose from the dead, you don't need to understand it. You just got to believe it and that you believe you're a sinner and that you need a Savior and you ask for forgiveness of your sin. A miracle happens in your heart. Yes, yes. How many people have received that miracle of new amen. birth in Christ? Oh, yeah. Amen. You were a wretch. Hallelujah. I don't know about you. I was a wretch. Let me talk about me. I was a mess. I was a wretch. But God saved me. And it was a miracle. Amen. It was a miracle that happened. I, but I want you to know there was an exchange that took place. Amen. I was unworthy. But he allowed the worthy one to die in my place. And God allowed that to be an exchange. And look, when that there's a transaction that takes place. A transaction that takes place. Because see... The last words, and these words have been on my mind a lot lately. The last words I believe that Jesus spoke was when he's, he said, it is finished. And in the Greek, the word is tilio or telesta, telesta. And really with the idea, if I could give you an illustration, it'd be like a paid in full stamp. Paid in full. It was stamped right there. Paid in full. That's what he was talking about. The sin debt has been paid in full. All that was made wrong in Adam has been made right. It is finished. Amen. And listen, when your confession of faith, when you believe that, clashes in the spirit realm with those words that Jesus spoke, it is finished. Hallelujah. A miracle takes place. Now, I just imagine there's an old revivalist named Leonard Ravenhill. I love Leonard Ravenhill. Yeah, I love his yeah. stuff. But one of his comments was this, is that he said on that day when Jesus said it is finished, he said, I'm quite certain that that sound reverberated through the Jordan Rift Valley, through the valley of the Jordan and entered every cavern in hell and caused those demons to shudder because they knew. And it was almost like I had taken some of these words out of my nose, but it's like, oh, oh, what did we do? <laughs> what did we do? See, they thought that they was getting the victory. See, you can't deceive the creator. The deceiver might be able to deceive you. He might be able to deceive me, but he can't deceive. He wants to lay a, he wants to lay a snare for the Lord, for, for humans. That's one thing. But guess what? He got caught in his own trap. Amen. And, and praise God, through that victory, you and I can also uh, experience that victory. Right. This word atonement is also translated as reconciliation. Yeah. All right. Sometimes in the English, in the English, is that same Greek word is translated as reconciliation. Look at Second Corinthians five seventeen and eighteen. I love these two verses of scripture. It says, "Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature." I want you to see that. You know, you know why that verse right there is so powerful to me. The first time I walked into a church. Well, that's not true. The day I got, the, the night I got saved, the night I went to the altar and prayed a prayer and asked the Lord to save me. <clears throat> that scripture right there, the preacher, she, they, she, she told me that. She said, you're a new creature now. And I never, I'll never forget this scripture. You're, if any man is in Christ, the Bible says he is a new creature. The idea is he's a new creation. That's right. You're recreated again mm -hmm. in Christ. That's what spiritually speaking a miracle happens in your recreation. He says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. See, the people from your past, they may never let you live your past now. Right? I've done talked to a whole lot of people like, they're like, yeah, but you was all messed up on drugs. And, you know, anyway, I, I'm not going to tell you what I told them. But what I am going to say is this. It is that there's a lot of times people, whether they be your family, whether they be your friends, whether they be people you used to go to church with, whether they be people you do go to church with, they, they may try to make you stay stuck in your past. They may, but that's not what the Lord says. The Lord says if you're in Christ, yes. you're a new creation. Yes. And, and yeah, amen. And, 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 and guess what we got to do? We got to allow the word of God to renew our mind to where we begin to believe it. See, because that's what God believes about you and I. God believes that if we've given our heart and our life to the Lord, that we are a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But the problem that we have is, is that we don't know who we are in Christ. 
We don't understand that we're new creations because we have not availed ourselves to the word of God. We still believe what the devil says about us. We still believe what people say about us in our past. No, we need our mind to line up with the truth that's in our spirit now if we truly are born again and that we come to the revelation and understanding that no, the old man that was born of Adam died with Jesus on the cross. I'm getting somewhere with this. I know this is about prayer, but just bear with me. It's about forgiving people of their debts. But, and, and so because, because he's forgiven us of our debts. Amen. Yes. Uh, but, but I need you to know that, that, that this, that this new creation, it's so powerful. Amen. And that all things, and look what it says in verse 18. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Yes, yes. And, uh, now that's powerful. Yes. You got to really think about this. If you're a person that's going to be a Bible reader, how did, good did you do in school? I'm not asking you to raise your hand and tell me. I'm just saying. Like when you, sometimes you got to apply yourself, right? Dude, I flunked out in elementary school. I mean, listen, I passed, I passed seventh and eighth grade by one point. One point, the teacher did not want me back in the class. They just let me go forward. Okay, I quit high school in the 10th grade. Okay, I started off in honors classes and ended up in basic classes. It wasn't because I didn't have the ability. It was because I refused to do the work. Okay, but then after the Lord got a hold of me, praise God, I give him glory, things changed. And then the next thing you know, they thought they called me a nerd in college. I was sitting at the front of the class. I did the little oral history report. I didn't mean to get into this, but this is kind of funny. So I took this, this history professor that everybody hated, and he allowed us to do this oral history report. And I went and I... Uh, I, I interviewed my, my uncle, who was a torpedo bomber in World War II, and he got the Navy Cross for sinking a Japanese something. I don't know what kind of boat it was. So I interviewed him, and so I turned it in, and I ended up with an A in the class. And so I'm walking out of the class on the last day. I got this. I'm, like, I'm so excited because it was such a hard class. And I didn't really feel like I deserved the A because my grade, I studied, but you know what I'm getting at. My, my test grades weren't that good. And so the girl, you made an A? And she was, you know, pretty young, you know, she was just out of high school and I was a little older. I'd been in the oil field and I didn't want to stay in the oil field. So I was hungry. I was working hard, you know, and she said, you made an A. I said, yeah, I said, I did that. I said, the only thing I can think is I did that oral history report. She, you nerd. She called me a nerd. I'm like, oh, All I can tell you is I got an A and you don't want to have it with your grade. So anyway, what was my point? We got to put, we got to put some work into some of this to understand the things of God, right? And to understand uh, what God has done for us. But, but I want you to real quick, before we move on, the ministry of reconciliation. Yes. I, I want you to know that what that means is this, is that God, he, Paul was talking specifically of himself. But I'm here to tell you as a believer that you're supposed to be engaging in the ministry. Do you believe that? That you're supposed to be doing more? And it's okay if I get people upset. I'm not trying to do that. But do you understand that when you become born again and you become filled with the Holy Spirit, if you read the scripture, you're supposed to do more than just sit in church on a Sunday morning right. and, and, and did, then you spend the rest of your time in the recliner flipping through the channels Amen. or watching football on Sunday. I'm not trying to judge you for watching football. I love football, but I'm trying to make a point. The scripture makes it very clear that God's people are supposed to be engaging within the battle and they're supposed to be part of this ministry ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? That means that people are lost. That means that people are dying and that they're dying without God. That means that if what you, you showed up here on a cold morning, I don't even know what temperature, what it did, but it was cold and you got out of bed and you got dressed and you came to church this morning and I commend you for that. Okay. But you, if you got out of bed and, and, and this cold and you came into the church, you must, you must be believing something or looking for something. And I'm here to tell you this morning that you're supposed to be engaged with God. That is really your purpose in life. My purpose, and I know I share this a lot, but my purpose in life is not to be the best nurse practitioner that, that I can be. The, the, the doctor's purpose in life is not to be the best doctor. I, I've worked with doctors. They live their whole life practicing medicine for 45 years. Then they retire with a nest egg full of money. They play golf for 10 years and then they die. I'm here to tell you right now, if the word of God is true, you have a purpose. You have an eternal purpose. God's plan was, is all about creating an eternal family. 
Do you, do you believe that this morning? Do, do you understand that there's an inheritance that awaits those that live for God, that give their life for God? Oh, I'm not in it for the inheritance or the reward preacher. Well, praise God, neither am I. But do you understand what it's going to feel like if you just squandered your life on earth? James, the Lord's half-brother, said this word, this life is a vapor. It's here one moment and it's gone the next. And then what? And if the story's true and there's eternity to face and you were, you were supposed to work for God, live for God. Listen, I feel like we're going to do some teaching on the kingdom coming up and about kingdom parables here in the... In a little bit, but that's what it's all about. The kingdom parables are talking about a good man went on a long journey and he left. He left talents, which means money. He left work that needed to be done and he went on a long journey, but then he comes back and he settles accounts. And what was it that they did with the time that they were on earth? I'm trying to encourage you. Some people may feel like, well, it's not very encouraging. No, but it can be encouraging. If we give our life to the Lord, we start now. God's the God of restoration. Whatever the enemy means to take away and to steal, God will do an amazing, powerful, miraculous work. Amen. And he, by the Holy Spirit, he is not restrained to be able to do anything. He can do a work in your heart and in your life. But look, if, you, if we're going to sit here and allow darkness to continue to be Lord over us, we're going to continue to allow the enemy to have his way with us. Now, after what Jesus has done for us, then we're living a subpar life as a Christian. That's right. And listen, one day I got to tell you, I am convinced of this. You're going to face the Lord. Yeah. I'm going to face the Lord. And, and you're either in or you're out. Like you've either put your faith in Christ or you haven't. That's the scripture. I'm telling you what I've learned about the Bible. I know some of you got to just kind of trust me a little bit here because maybe you never read the Bible. But, but I've read the Bible, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm hoping that you'll trust me enough to tell you that the Scripture is clear. You're either in or you're out. You've either accepted Jesus' sacrifice for your sin and been forgiven and, had, and, and received the atonement and been reconciled to God, or you have not. And, 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 and then you're going to be judged based on that. Amen. And, but then at the same time, it also taught, and that's a great white throne judgment, that, that men and women will stand before a holy God and give an account. And if you're not covered in the blood of Jesus, if you don't have your wedding garment on, the scripture says in one of the parables about the king that had a wedding feast for his son. If you don't have a wedding garment on, he's going to say, friend, how in the world did you get in here? You got to go. Because the wedding garment represents the righteousness of Jesus that was given to you as a gift because of your faith and what he did for you at the cross. But there's another judgment for believers. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And you and I are going to be judged on what we did in this life for Jesus. And, and it's going to be a sad day if we stand before the Lord and we did not do what it was that he called us to do. And I don't know what he's calling you to do specifically. That's right. I know what he's calling me to do. And can I tell you this? You can't do it in your own strength. Amen. I can't do it in my own strength. That's right. It's got to be a work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we got to allow, but we got to allow the Lord to have his way in us. Amen. Amen. And to surrender to his will. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a slave of the devil no more. I, mean, I let the devil have too much of my time. Amen. Look, Paul believed this. The apostle Paul is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. I, that dude, that guy was a man. We don't know what he looked like, but I'm telling you, some people say he was short. Some people say he couldn't see too well. I don't know if we can really prove that. We don't really know what he looked like. But he did say this at one time, like almost like he couldn't speak too well. You know, like his, he did say this. He said that his presence wasn't very intimidating, but that the words that he was speaking were going to have the power of God behind it. So kind of makes you think that maybe... As far as for, you know, what we think of physical men, that maybe he didn't carry that, but he obviously carried a lot of weight, weight in the kingdom. I love him so much because he didn't quit. I love him so much because he, he, he had so much endurance. It, you know, spiritually, it reminds me of what my daddy was trying to teach me to be as in the physical, but he was that in the spiritual. I mean, anybody that's beaten five times with stick, well, I might be getting them mixed up five times, three times with five times with sticks, three times with a whip and lash, uh, <clears throat> mugged, mugged coming down from Jerusalem towards Jericho, got his his clothes stole to left naked because that's what they used to do. They used to have muggers hiding in the rocks 
And they'd steal their clothes, dude. They didn't have clothes. Left for, left for, got stoned and left for dead, shipwrecked, and he never quit. He just, he just kept going. He, he, they, they stoned him. I talked about that the other night. Stoned him and drug him outside of the city to let him die. And the Holy Spirit touched him and he said, well, let's go to the next city. Maybe they'll receive the, receive the word of God over there. And then he came back to the same city a couple of weeks later to make sure that the people that had received the gospel were okay. It's like, what? What in the world? And finally got his head cut off under Emperor Nero. Man, I got to listen to what this guy's got to say. So in this passage of scripture, Acts chapter 26, Haley, if you could go to the NASB, I want to read some of this to you. We're still talking about forgiveness, okay? In Acts 26, uh, verse 13, in the NASB, Paul believed this about forgiveness and he preached it. Now I want to give you a little bit of background. Right now, Paul is incarcerated. He's incarcerated for preaching the gospel and he's already appealed because this is, not, this is too deep for me to get into right now, but he was a Roman citizen. He was Jewish, but he was Roman citizen by birth. That means a lot. Yeah. You know, my dad, look, I'm just going to try to explain something to you. My dad told me that when he was in the Marine Corps, he, he, was, he was a mess, uh, and he got into a fight with, with some people in Mexico. And I'm just trying to give you an illustration. And he saw somebody running at him with their hand up like that. And at the last second, he stepped back and hit him and knocked him into the street. And the car ran over. And in the process, somebody had cut his ear and it was, and they incarcerated him. They put him in jail. And he was in there for two days. His ear kept getting bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden, an MP came, a Marine police or some type of a military police. Might, might not have been Marine. I don't know. But this military police came into that jail in Mexico and told whoever. He said, I'm here to get my Marine and pulled him up and took him out, okay? And what I'm trying to say is, is that the Apostle Paul as a Roman citizen had rights like that. Like, and I don't know if that would go over that well right now in the way the condition of America, but what I'm trying to say is you and I have rights as an American citizen and thank God for those that, that helped to fight for our rights and thank God for those that have gone before us yeah. to fight for those rights. But we have rights as an American citizen that other people have not enjoyed. The Apostle Paul as a Roman citizen had rights. And when he was incarcerated in this, this Roman, this prison that wasn't in Rome, he said, I'm a Roman citizen and I appeal to Caesar. And so basically they were forced to put him on a boat and to send him to Rome. But right now he's not in Rome yet. He's still around the area of Asia Minor. And, and he's, he's given, he, but he stands up. He, they, they called him out. Uh, one of the kings showed up. His name was King Agrippa. And, and, and there, was a, there was a governor there named Festus. And, and Festus said, I need you to, King Agrippa came to visit. And he said, I need you to see this, this Jew. Because you're part Jew, right? You're Jewish. And I want you to see this guy we have incarcerated. I probably wouldn't let him go, but he said that he's going to see Caesar because, see, God had a plan for his life to go to Rome and to preach the gospel in Rome, all right? And so it says, so Paul begins to, I'm telling you, Paul believed in forgiveness. So he stands up in the midst of this crowd. No, no telling how many people are there. And he says, at midday, O king, he's telling his story. Paul's telling his testimony to us right now. At midday, O king, I saw on the way. Now listen, he was on the road to Damascus. Stephen the martyr, the first martyr recorded in the Bible, had just been stoned. Paul's name was Saul at that point in time. And it said that Saul consented and allowed them to throw stones at Stephen. And Saul sat there and watched Stephen die. And then Saul said, you know what? I hate these Christians. I hate these Christians. And I'm getting an entourage. And we're going to Damascus in Syria. And we're going to get letters from the Jewish rulers up there. And we're about to really pour on the heat on these Christians. We're about to drive them into prison. We're about to kill them. We're about to torture them because we're going to stop this because they're coming against the God of Israel. Little did he know he was fighting against God. And so he says, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Some scriptures say pricks. The idea, this is like a, a, you're seeing a cattle prod. 
Nowadays they have electric cattle prods. Back then they had sharp sticks and they would stick the stick in the hindquarters of the animal to make it go in the right direction. The Lord was saying, I'm trying to prod you to get you to go in the right direction. But instead you're kicking against the goad. You're kicking against what it, the direction that I'm trying to bring you. And he said, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. And Paul said, I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you. This is the purpose, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. Verse 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. That is so powerful. God, listen, God has a plan upon the earth and his plan is to save people from the bondage of sin. His plan is to save people from the dominion of darkness and to bring them into light. And God specifically chose Paul and he's chosen you amen to come out of darkness and to be forgiven of sins and, and to understand that he's given us a purpose to share the good news with people so that other people can at least hear the opportunity. At least have the opportunity to hear that there's a real God. Listen, the church world is so messed up right now. Lord, help us. The word of God told us that in the last days that people would depart from the faith. That they would give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Listen, I'm not trying to say everybody's wrong. I'm just trying to make a point. The word of God warned us. This same apostle warned us that in the last days there would be demonic doctrines that would lead people astray. People don't want to hear about forgiveness because they don't want to hear about sin. People don't want to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit on their life or to be told that they've been living their life wrong. I'm sorry. That's the Word of God. The Word of God has had to convict me and He still convicts me. Yeah. Every time I get into the presence of the Lord, I feel the conviction of the yeah. Holy Spirit. Yeah. He convicted me last night about something that I said yesterday. I, don't even, I didn't even do it on purpose, but my point is He convicted me. And I said, Lord, forgive me for what I I did Lord because I felt like I hurt somebody instead of helped them yeah. and I didn't mean to do it but it happened it don't matter whether you meant to do it or not if you did it and you hurt instead of help but now I can help because I'm going to pray for that person yeah. I'm going to pray and believe God that God's going to work in them and do a work in their heart and in their life so Paul believed and look Colossians 1 13 through 14 this is still the NASB he said he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Wow, he, he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his son. He redeemed us. That means he bought us back with his blood. He redeemed us with his blood and he's given us forgiveness of sins. So look, I used all these scriptures to remind you of the loving plan of God that's revealed through his son. I used all these scriptures previous to describe the fact that the foundation of God's kingdom is built upon the forgiveness he offers man through the sacrifice of Jesus. So my question now, I'm shifting gears a little bit, is why do we as God's people struggle so much forgiving others after we have received this gift of forgiveness, this atonement, this reconciliation? People often convince themselves that they have forgiven but many times they still harbor unforgiveness in their hearts, saying you have forgiven someone and really forgiving them are two different things. I want to say that again. Saying you have forgiven someone and really forgiving them are two different things. And I got a little heart emoji in my notes because I wanted to make this point. It's a heart thing. See, when you do get saved, when you truly get converted, a miracle, that miracle I was talking about, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. That's what the Bible says. I know it's true because I've experienced it. There's also times in my life that I did not yield to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And my conscience started to get seared. And I couldn't hear him as clearly as what I used to. 
But what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that if you're in tune with the Holy Spirit and you come to get along with the Lord in prayer or you're just living your life, what will happen is, and I know this is true because it happens, it's, it happens to me, it happened to me recently regarding a, a, another person. And it wasn't bad. Thank, see, if you can start to recognize when the things first start to show up, you can deal with it right then and there. But if you ignore it and act like it's not a problem, see, because you, I don't know what's in your heart unless the Holy Spirit lets me see it. You don't know what's in my heart. Okay. <laughs> Praise God. Cause y'all be trying to blast that stuff up on the video. Right. <laughs> but but what, what I'm trying to say is this, is that when the Holy Spirit starts to show you something's not right in here, you can feel, even if it's the slightest twinge, if you're close to the Lord, you can feel it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Am I the only one in here that's ever felt that before? I don't believe that. We know immediately when the Holy Spirit's telling us that we're not right. And what we do many times is we ignore it. And ignoring that is a problem, Christian. You, If you're going to walk with God and live for God, you have to be able to deal with what the Holy Spirit is talking to you about right then and there. This heart... I mean, it's not really the muscle that pumps your blood. The heart is part of the inner man, which is interconnected with the soul and the spirit of man. It's your inner man. This heart is a treasure chest. It's the place where the Lord lives. It's the place where the Lord speaks. It's the, it's the place where the Lord wants to lead and guide. And, and if we don't pay attention to what's going on in here, because I can promise you, you're going to be offended. I'm going to offend you. I've already offended some of you. And I hope that you've learned to learn to forgive because I've forgiven you. Because there ain't nobody in this place perfect. Amen. And if we don't learn how to forgive one another, if we're going to just be easily offended, let me tell you, if you don't learn your lesson today, you're going to have to face it again tomorrow. Amen. You can Listen, people can get up, they can go find, they can go to 10 different churches I'm telling you, there are probably a whole lot better churches. I, I get that. Or one that might fit somebody else better. I don't know. But I promise you, if you do not learn to let the Lord deal with your heart, you are going to get offended pretty quickly when you move on to the next church. You don't think everything's bumping along just fine. Oh, I finally found a place where I'm supposed to be. And boom, here it comes. And you're going to have to face it all over again. Because that's how human beings are. And I hate to say it, sometimes Christians are the worst. Yes. Lord, help us. Change us. But let me say this to somebody watching on video. Don't you be blaming Jesus for the way Christians act. <laughs> Don't you be blaming Jesus for the way preachers act. Because because that, that does not mean that Jesus isn't real. No, Jesus proved his love. Amen? All right. Praise God. It's a hard thing. So why is it so hard? Look at Matthew chapter 18. Actually, you can just you can just go to verse uh, verse thirty five, but black in the screen until I get there, and I'm just going to kind of tell them about it a little bit. So in Matthew chapter eighteen, there's a story. It's a parable, and, and Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a king who took account of his servants. And there was one servant that owed ten thousand talents. I didn't go back to try to figure out exactly what it is, but it was a lot of money. The servant owed the king a lot of money, but and and he said he didn't have it to pay. And so the king's like, well, okay, well, you know what? That's okay. I'll take your wife and I'll take your children um, and, you know, whatever else that I need to, to get because I'm going to get paid because this is my kingdom and I'm going to get paid. And so the servant falls down on his knees and he starts crying out to the Lord, to the, ser to the king. He's like, he felt he worshiped him. Lord, please have patience with me. I'll pay you everything that you owe me. Everything, like, I'll, I'll pay you everything that I owe you, right? And so out of compassion... The king's like, okay, well, all right. It looks like you, you're sincere, so I'll have mercy on you, and I'll have compassion on you. And so he, he went ahead and he, he, he forgave him. Okay, but then the same servant went out, and he found one of his fellow servants, which owed him 100 pence, which is a small amount. And he laid hands on him, and he took him by the throat. And he, and he said, pay me what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and started to ask him. He said, please have patience with me. Same exact words. And I will pay you all. And he would not. But instead he cast him into prison till he would pay the debt. Now if you'll, if you'll look at verse 34 actually. And it says, and his Lord was wroth. Which means angry, very angry in the old uh, English language. And delivered him to the tormentors. 
till he should pay all that was due him. So likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you. Look at this. If you from your heart yes. forgive not everyone his brother his trespasses. From your heart. It's not lip service. It's not in your mind. It's you doing business with God. It's God speaking to you. And he's saying, you got something going on right there. I'm not pointing at anybody. I'm pointing out at the ground. But I'm pointing at your heart. I'm pointing at my heart. You got something in there. And you got to let me do business with that. And only the Holy Spirit is the one that can do business with that. But, you, but, but listen, many times people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that. They want to hold on to that. They want to stay with a victim mentality. Oh, Lord, help us. They want to stay with a victim mentality. Listen, a lot of wrongs have been done to people. People have been really hurt. And I get that. But only the Lord can heal us. Uh, you know, and how dare they do me wrong. But you've done people wrong. You've done people wrong. You're not. Look, come on. Help me out here. Somebody, I'm going pre to preach to y'all over here. Amen. We've done people wrong. Yes. I can remember one time a family member. And it's a long story, but look, I felt like some bad, some things happened in the situation, and I couldn't, I didn't understand it, and I felt like they had done me, they were doing me wrong. I felt like that. I don't know if it was true, but that's how I felt. And I was dry, and I was frustrated because I was close to this person, and I felt like they had kind of turned on me a little bit, and I was taking it personal. And I can remember I was driving down the road, and the Lord had already got a hold of my heart. So praise God for that. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said, how dare you? How dare you hold them in contempt? I, how dare you call unclean what my blood is made clean? No, no, no. When I said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I meant it when I said it. And look how they treated me. And you're not really forgiving from your heart. I want to encourage you, Christian. It's so important for you and I uh, to forgive. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 30 through 32. It says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. The word grieve means to offend or to make uneasy. You remember earlier in the year I was talking about that, the, the, how the Spirit of God is symbolized by a dove throughout the scripture. And you can imagine the dove and how when he feels comfortable in a place, he's, he's flitting around, right? And he wants to minister to our hearts and he wants to have his way with us. But that there's certain behavior that a Christian can exhibit that would grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. With all malice and be ye kind one to another, tender, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Look at this. Even as God, for Christ's sake. Has forgiven you. Bitterness will spread in your heart. See, if you if you if you don't really let your heart truly forgive from your heart, then now you're giving an opportunity for the enemy to cause a root of bitterness to spring up. And bitterness in your heart will it, it ain't it's not gonna destroy the person you're mad at, it'll destroy you. And it'll destroy your walk with God. Amen. Uh, and it's not it's not a good thing, right? Um, Hebrews 12, you don't have to turn to it. I'm just going to, it says, follow peace with all men in holiness without which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently, lest any man fell of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness, look at this, springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Mm -hmm. Bitterness springing up in you can defile you. If you look in the original language right there, it means that your garment gets stained. There's a scripture out of Zechariah chapter 3 where the high priest, the enemy's accusing him. It says Satan's standing at his right hand, accusing him, and that his garments are filthy. You, you know, the word of God says this, that, the, that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And, and if we have bitterness in our heart, that's just one thing. I'm not saying that's what Joshua the high priest was dealing with. But if we have bitterness in our heart, that is one accusation that the enemy has against us. And we think that we're okay with the Lord. But we have bitterness in our heart or unforgiveness in our heart. And the word of God says that we're supposed to forgive. No, we're not okay with the Lord. But we continue to go on in our life acting like we're okay. All right, I got a few little things I want to share with you. Uh, and then we're going to close. Praise God. Unforgiveness will affect your prayer life. 
I'm just going to tell you real quick. Mark 11, verse 25 says, And when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against anyone. And your Father in heaven will forgive you. So many times whenever you go to pray, the Lord will remind you yes. of something that's not right. And the scripture says for you to go and to make it right. You know why people don't go make it right? A lot of times, can I, can I just be real with you? A lot of times people don't go make it right. Well, first of all, let me just say this. Make it right with God first. Yes. If you'll really make it right with God, sometimes depending on the situation, he may not ask you to go to the other person because sometimes it might make it worse. Right. right. But if you make it right with God, many times he will ask you to make it right with that other human being. And, and when you know why people won't do that? Because they have to admit that they were wrong. And some people will not admit they're wrong. Some people are, and they don't even realize that that is a symptom of pride. And pride will destroy you, your walk with God. Uh, you, I'm just, I just want to share that with you. You cannot, we cannot live in pride. If the Holy Spirit's telling us something, we cannot resist what the Holy Spirit's telling us to do. All right, so that's number one. Unforgiveness will affect your prayer life. Number two, I want you to know this. Unforgiveness will prevent your worship from being accepted. Right. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, it says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there, remember your brother has ought against you. Leave your gift before the altar. Go your way and first be reconciled to your brother. Now, the gift, could, I looked it up. In the original language, it could mean two things. It could mean a sacrifice, but it could also mean the money that they were giving into the treasure. So, so we can sit here, we can give our sacrifice of praise. I'm not picking on nobody because the Lord knows Pastor Matt's done it. We give our sacrifice of praise, put our money in the basket, but we have ought in our heart. And we're acting like we're okay. And, and, and the Lord's not okay with that. All right? I want you to know that Jesus forgave until the end. So we must Forgiven to the end. And the scripture that I think about, I'm not going to read it, but the thief on the cross. To the very end, look, if you go back and you read that story, it said there were two thieves, right? They were each on one side of Jesus. And early in the morning, the Bible says that the religious leaders laughed at him. Come down off that cross. You said you were going to save the world. You can't even save yourself. And they laughed. And then, and then the world's walking by. Look at him. And they were wagging their head. The Bible said, look at him. He can't, he can't he's stuck up there. He said he was all that. And he can't even get himself down. And, even, and then it says, and the thieves cast the same into his teeth. Meaning they also talk bad about him. Yeah, why don't you, why don't you save yourself? You know, and, and both of them were doing that. But something happened at some point in time. And one of them thieves turned to him and said, Lord, when you enter into paradise, you know, he said, whenever you enter into your kingdom, would you bring me with you? And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. See, Jesus forgave him to the end. And, and what I want you, this is just something that I thought was pretty cool. I'm not trying to like promote anybody or pat anybody on the back, but Jesus had a conversation with Peter. He said, Lord, how often should, I, should my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times, because that's the number of God's perfection. Jesus says unto him, I say not unto you until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And this is kind of like a difficult concept to, to describe, but in the Daniel, there's a prophecy in the book of Daniel where it's talking about the end of the age. It talked about the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Roman Empire. And it talked about a total of 490 years. It was 70 sets of seven. It said 70 weeks. So 70 sevens are determined upon your people. But the number actually came out to 490 years. Scholars say that if you do the math from the time that, that Cyrus, I believe it was Cyrus, the Persian king, allowed the Jews to go back and rebuild the, the altar and the, and the wall. From that time until Jesus died on the cross was 483 years. You have to use like a, a Jewish and a Gregorian calendar to come up with it. It's above my pay rate. But 483 years, so that means there's a last seven-year period, right? And so the last seven-year period, most scholars believe, is the last seven-year tribulation period. And so essentially, what it's saying is 70 times 7 equals 490 years. And Aaron was talking to Jessica one time about this video that he had watched and shared with her. I think he shared the video with her. I don't know. But he, but he said, it, it, 
uh, Aaron said that the guy was talking about 70 times 7. You got to forgive 70 times 7, which comes out to 490 like the prophecy. And Jessica said, so that means we have to forgive until the end. That means that we that, that we have to forgive until the end. That's what Jesus was saying. That that, that might hit you later. That, that maybe that didn't hit you, but but that's powerful, powerful stuff. It's like a beautiful revelation to understand that no, we don't just forgive tomorrow. We don't just forgive the next day. We don't just forgive in a week. God's saying, no, you must forgive until the very end, just like I forgave. Amen. I'm closing with this. Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. This is the last thing I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I wanted to say. I wanted to say this. Number four, true forgiveness is a work of the Spirit. I want you to know that. Amen. Because some of you might be sitting in here and you're like, man, I want to forgive, but I, but I just, I can't forgive. But I have to tell you that you can forgive if you allow the Holy Spirit yes. to do the work in you. If you feel like you're all jammed up and you feel like you can't release it, it's because you're trying in your own strength. Yes. The Word of God says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. There's other ones, but I want to focus on that one. That word long-suffering, you know what it's talking about? Patience in relationships. It means that if people have done you wrong, the fruit of the Spirit in your life can give you the grace that you need to forgive and the Holy Spirit in you will do the work that you cannot do. Amen.